Hello, I'm Ron Strickland. This webcast is one of a series in which I'm providing some brief lectures and commentaries on topics from the courses I teach in literary and cultural studies. In this installment, I'll provide some background on British cultural studies in the 1970s and 80s. I'll discuss some of the conditions that led to the establishment of the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies at Birmingham. I'll discuss the work of key members of the Birmingham group and the influence of Birmingham School of Cultural Studies on cultural studies scholarship around the globe. The Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies was founded in 1964 with Richard Hoggart as its first head. The Center was established to provide an institutional structure for the study of culture much more broadly defined than traditional culture. There is a tradition in Britain, going back at least to the publication of Matthew Arnold's Culture and Anarchy in 1869, of recognizing the importance of culture for maintaining political order in modern society. In the first part of the 20th century, this conservative cultural political project was carried on by formalist and aestheticist literary critics. F. R. Levis promoted the teaching and the study of canonical literature through his journal Scrutiny, in books like The Great Tradition, and in his teaching at Cambridge. But by the late 1950s, people like Richard Hoggart in his book The Uses of Literacy and Raymond Williams in his book Culture and Society were recognizing the limitation of analysis of canonical literary texts for addressing the complexity of modern British culture. In books like Culture and Society and in The Long Revolution, published in 1961, Raymond Williams articulated a theory of culture that differed sharply from the dominant theory of culture then prevailing in British and American literary studies. Levisism in Great Britain and the New Criticism in the United States promoted an understanding of literature as the product of rare genius that transcends the particularities of local historical moments. For Levis and for the New Critics, great literature and great art defined their national cultures. But this meant an understanding of culture limited to the canonical tradition and detached from everyday life. By contrast, Williams was interested in defining a national culture that changed over history and a definition of culture in which there is not a clear line of demarcation between the canonical tradition of high culture and the culture of everyday life. During the late 1970s and early 1980s, under the directorship of Stuart Hall, the Birmingham School had its period of greatest impact. Critics and scholars associated with the Center applied Louis Althusser's theories of ideology and subjectivity to subcultural groups within English society. Althusser's theory proved to be of some use to the Birmingham School in attempting to account for such anomalies as members of the working class who voted for conservative politicians. In the long run, however, Althusser's very abstract conception of the ideological state apparatus and his very pessimistic view of the possibility of resistance or agency on the part of the subject gave way in the work of the Birmingham School to the influence of Antonio Gramsci's conception of hegemony, which had been originally published in the 1920s, but had only recently been translated into English. Gramsci had developed his concept of hegemony in the context of the rise of Mussolini. Gramsci was concerned to understand why working-class Italians would support fascism. A similar puzzle presented itself in early 1980s Britain with working-class support for Thatcherism. But Birmingham School critics and theorists were especially interested in ferreting out overlooked instances of working-class and other subcultural resistance to the hegemonic power of the dominant ideology. A good example of this kind of cultural criticism is Paul Willis's Learning to Labor. In a multidimensional study of the attitudes and behaviors of working-class teenage boys, Willis explores the way the working-class youth subculture establishes and consolidates 
values and attitudes that contradict the values and attitudes promoted by the official school culture. The subculture cultivates and rewards an attitude of mistrust towards school authority. What Willis finds is not particularly surprising. What was distinctive about Willis's study was that he saw the anti-authoritarian attitudes and behaviors of these working class youth as part of an ensemble of successful strategies for establishing class solidarity and for coping with a social order designed to exploit these young people in their adult lives. Of course, Willis acknowledged the obvious irony. The same set of resistance practices and social coping strategies more or less ensured that these young men would not advance up the socioeconomic status hierarchy. In a series of articles in the 1980s, Angela McRobbie, another member of the Birmingham School, analyzed the acculturation process of working-class teenage girls along the lines established by Willis. The work of Willis and McRobbie and other members of the Birmingham School, and in particular Dick Hebdige's book Subculture, the Meaning of Style, is notable for its early theorized critical attention to youth culture. In the Fordist regime of industrial production, social subjectivity was predicated on the adult male workers' productive capacity. The social subjectivities of women and children were constituted in relation to that of the adult male worker. Teenagers were not productive workers. Hence, they were not fully-fledged social subjects, and certainly not social agents. But they did become agents as consumers after World War II. The teenager is, in fact, the ideal subject of an economic order in which consumer demand for services and non-durable goods seemingly generates profits out of thin air. Teenagers are primarily consumers rather than producers. Most of the income of teenage workers is discretionary income, disposable income that can be spent on consumer-oriented leisure goods rather than basic necessities. In their studies of youth culture, members of the Birmingham group have not been entirely immune to a danger that confronts scholars of youth culture in general, that is, of a tendency to celebrate as meaningful instances of subversive consumption subcultural fads, trends, or styles from the punk subculture, from rap, or from grunge as meaningful resistance to the dominant order at the level of style. In Postmodernism and Popular Culture, for example, Angela McRobbie discusses the rag market, thrift shopping, and the ongoing popularity of retro fashion as an implicit critique of consumerism the fashion industry, and the social inequities of late capitalism. As interesting as many of these studies can be, in my view, subversive consumption remains a highly compromised strategy for political agency. In the words of Dick Hebdige, youth subcultural styles are meaningful mutations, capable of embodying a symbolic refusal of the social consensus upon which Western democracies depend. But, in the end, no amount of subcultural incantation can alter the oppressive mode in which the commodities used in a subculture have been produced. With that, I'll conclude this webcast. But, if you have questions or comments about this topic, send me an email.